Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of NOAA Southeastern University's South Florida Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program podcast, also known as the SF Web podcast. We are here to educate, encourage, enhance our knowledge and skills, and promote all those amazing health profession experts working with the elderly, including caregivers and interprofessional teams. My name is Dr. Shweta Tewari, and I'm an assistant professor at the Kuran C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine at Nova Southeastern University, as well as the administrative director for the South Florida Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program. In today's episode, we're taking an in-depth look at the future of geriatric care with a subject matter expert, Dr. Eric Eliayev. Dr. Eliayev is a physician, entrepreneur, and educator with a passion for improving health care delivery. He founded MyHouseVisit.com, a medical home visit organization, and co-founded iConnect.io, a technology platform for care coordination. He also served as a regional medical director of hospice for the Visiting Nurse Service of New York and held academic appointments at Turo College, St. George's Medical University and Nova Southeastern University. Outside of work, Dr. Eliyayev enjoys spending time with his family and producing music. Hello, Dr. Eliyayev. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our SF Web podcast, and I want you to thank you for your time and expertise. Can you please tell us a little bit about your background to our listeners? Well, thank you so much. First of all, I wanted to thank everybody for the opportunity. You guys are doing such amazing work here, and Sveta, thank you so much, Dr. Pandia, the whole NSU team. It's really a pleasure to be here. I wanted to give you, to start off a little bit with a story, right? And, and I've said this story because the story defines me. When I came out of residency in 2012, I was looking, what am I going to do with my life, right? And I saw an ad out, house call doctor. And you get your own car. You get a driver. I'm like, wow, right? So the first day, there's this red, beautiful Audi that pulls up. There's a gentleman who has his glasses, shades. I felt like if anybody's ever watched the Transporter movie, I felt like I was being tr- like an important person being transported. So we go to the first patient's home, elderly lady, Mrs. Smith. And I'm sitting there for 15 minutes. 20 minutes, 30 minutes. She's like, doctor, why are you still here? I said, well, ma'am, you have so many medical comorbidities, so many medications, I need to go through everything. She's like, okay. So that was kind of lesson number one because she said the previous doctor was there only for 15 minutes, right? So that's lesson number one as far as medicine and value. Lesson number two is I'm reading the notes in the electronic healthcare record. And I came out in July, so I'm seeing her in August. And in May, the note says, patient has weight loss, needs to get a CAT scan of the abdomen, decreased appetite. June, same thing. July in the electronic healthcare record, same thing. And here I am in August, same thing. So me being a fresh out-of-school doctor, instead of, you know, asking her, did you have it done, I go on, Mrs. Smith, why didn't you get it done? And she says, you know, good old young doctor, I did get it done. I said, when? She said, in May. I said, oh, you got it done in May? Where? She's like, New York Methodist Hospital. I'm like, wonderful. Let me call. I I did my residency there. I can call folks and find out. So I call the radiology department, and I find out that, what's the reading? And the radiologist says, a mass in the liver, highly suspicious, for malignancy. Now this is in May where the patient had the CT scan done. I'm there in August. So I want your audience to think about a young doctor standing there trying to figure out how do I deliver that news to Mrs. Smith. And I remember I delivered that news. It was a very tough conversation. And after about a day of working with the organization, I said, guys, I love it. You guys are amazing, but it's too far to travel. Thank you for the Audi. But you know what? Uh, it's too far. And I went home, and I didn't, didn't, have a, didn't know what to do. Next day, my grandmother falls down from my mom's side. My mom's like, hey, she fell down. She doesn't want to go to the hospital. Can you do something? I said, okay. I went to see her, got an X-ray done at home, no fracture. Everything's great. She said, well, why don't you do this in our community, in the Buharian community in Queens. And it started and started and started. And that's how I got my start 
in geriatric care. Move forward 10 years forward, uh, grew the practice, had nurse practitioners, and we were acquired in a merger and acquisition by a very large direct contract entity called Concierto Care. Such an inspiring story. Now I know where your motivation comes from. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so moving on to our next question. You're often coined at saying that we need to move healthcare away from the blockbuster model to the Netflix model. Can you further explain that? Definitely, definitely. And I'll take a page out of the, the Oprah book and her show where, and I'm dating myself again, I used to watch Oprah back in the day, and she said, if you don't evolve, then you will dissolve, right? Wow, what a wonderful... If you don't evolve, you will dissolve. And there's a story about the CEO of Netflix, Mark Randolph. He actually wrote a book called That Will Never Work, amazing book. And he went to the CEO of Blockbuster. And he tells him, sir, the video cassette model of watching content is going to go extinct. We need to move to streaming. And the CEO of Blockbuster, who was dressed in a very nice pinstripe suit, looked him in the eye and said, that will never work. And now we know, if I'd like to ask you, take mm -hmm. a guess, I think we've talked about this before. Yes, we did. <laughs> How many blockbusters exist today? I think if I'm correct, it's one. It's one, and it's yeah. in Oregon, you are correct, from 9,000 stores. Mm -hmm. So that's how we are moving forward with medicine. We're still in the blockbuster model, where we need to move it to the Netflix model. Okay, since you talked about the Netflix model, how do you think that can be applied to the geriatric care today? And I'll tell you, that's a great, great question. I want to tell you real quickly two stories. One about, I always say this, about Harry and the other about Michael. Mm -hmm. Harry is an 85-year-old gentleman who loves golfing. Everything is great. On Monday at 8 p.m., he's not feeling well. He thinks it's a little bit of a cold. On Tuesday, he gets a little worse. Wednesday gets a little bit of chills, blood pressure is now about 100 over 50, baseline is 130, 140 over 90. And at Thursday at 8 p.m., he calls his doctor. Now, Sveta, what do you think? If Harry calls his doctor on a Thursday at 8 p.m., where is the doctor? Oh, not at work. Not at work. Home with the family, yeah. having dinner. Mm -hmm. And when, if I'm Harry and I'm telling the doctor, Sveta, hey, I'm not feeling well, my blood pressure is low, I have a cough, I have chills. You as the physician, what are you going to say to Harry? Go to the emergency room. Go to the emergency room. Because A, you care about Harry. You want to make sure you're not missing anything, right? Yeah. B, you care about your license and your liability. You, you don't know what's really going on. Mm -hmm. So what happens to Harry when he goes to the emergency room? It's cold. There's machines beeping, do, 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 people walking around. Harry's now getting confused, right? They do a chest x-ray. Mm -hmm. They find he has pneumonia. But now Harry has delirium because mm -hmm. he's in the hospital mm -hmm. with sepsis. He's confused. What do, he can't go to the bathroom. They've put in a Foley catheter. Okay, you put in a Foley catheter. Now he has a UTI mm -hmm. due to a foreign object being in his body. Mm -hmm. Now he's laying in bed for too long. He's mm -hmm. laying in bed now, he's having decubitus ulcers, mm -hmm. right? And it goes on and it goes on and it goes on and Harry goes home, a changed man. Mm -hmm. That's blockbuster. Now you're going to say, well, okay, how do you change that? Now, uh, right? I think we, I know where you're getting to into. Right. Yeah. Now yeah. I want you to meet Michael. Michael mm -hmm. lives in the Netflix model of medicine. Michael has a smart home. His home has sensors, two types of sensors. There's wearable sensors, right, that you're wearing. But, you know, the compliance there is you wear it, you don't wear it, you get information. You, Michael has IR sensors that actually sense his blood pressure, his heart rate, his oxygen saturation without any wearables. And the second that Michael's heart rate goes up and the oxygen saturation goes down by a little bit, where do you think that information goes to Sveta in the Netflix model? Mm, in the medical record, in the... It does, it goes to the cloud, you're correct. Yeah. But from the cloud, it also goes to a command center. Right. In the command center, there's two things. Number one, there is clinical decision support. There's a AI, as everybody talks about now, mm -hmm. right? And it, boom, it identifies the variants. Ding, ding, ding. On Monday and Tuesday, Michael's heart rate went from 70 to 90. Oxygen saturation went from 99 to 97. Is it a crazy d decrease, 99 to 97? No. Mm -hmm. But it's a variance. The medical command center then 
reaches out through AI to Sveta, who's sitting there, mm -hmm. right, Dr. Sveta. And then Dr. Sveta does a telemedicine visit to Michael. But let me ask you all, and let me ask Sveta, Dr. Sveta, when, you, when I do a telemedicine with you, and I'm looking into your phone, mm -hmm. and I see your picture there, how much data can I actually get? Can I do a physical exam? Probably not. I can see you, yeah. I can talk to you, but yeah. I can't hear your lungs. Mm -hmm. In the Netflix model, there is hardware that Michael was given. That hardware is a digital stethoscope. Mm -hmm. It's connected to the Wi-Fi in his home and to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And the breath sounds, Dr. Sveta is able to hear in real time. In and the ideal world. In, in the future of where we're yeah. going. And yeah. we will be there in the next five to ten years. And okay. we're actually at NSU, uh, we're kind of top secret, but we're working <laughs> on, uh, on, on a big proposal of bringing that to, to come forefront from NSU okay. with some very innovative people. And Dr. Bronsberg is actually is, is involved in that mission awesome. as well. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. And so what would happen to Michael then? Would Michael need to go to the hospital if I listened to his lungs remotely and I caught the variants and I gave him an antibiotic at home? Probably not. Probably not. That is where the Netflix model of medicine is moving towards. Right. And you know what? I'll tell you. I just came from a meeting of the uh, Academy of Healthcare Professionals or Executives. It's ACHE. And all of the CEOs in Florida were sitting by roundtables. And they were moving around from one table. This just happened an hour ago, from one table to another. And we had a chance to just pick their brain. And I asked them, where do you see healthcare moving? Where do you see geriatrics moving? And they said, everything is moving to the home. And hospital systems are now thinking about how to be involved in that transition of care. So can I ask you a different question, something associated with this? Yes. So... Telemedicine, of course, is something which, you know, I, I think we all got used to during the COVID times. But we're still having challenges and struggles to build a telemedicine visit. Do you think that insurance companies are going to buy this and kind of get into this whole model and that, allow the telemedicine visits? That's a wonderful, wonderful question. And you usually, see, you know, you see things moving, unfortunately, where the money moves, right? So you ask yourself, in 2000. 15, Medicare came out with something called chronic care management, where they were reimbursing physicians for speaking, for having a care coordinator use technology and speak to their patients, $40 per member per month. Now, if you have 300 members, that adds up. Then in 2017, because they saw CCM was working, they said, we're going to pay for something called remote patient monitoring. And they were paying physicians about 80 to $100 per member per month to get the blood pressure, to go from the home to the physician's office so they can preventively look at what's going on, CMS. Then recently, two years ago, they came out with something called remote therapeutic monitoring, which now CMS pays physical therapists to monitor patients remotely, their ambulation, their movement, their gait, and see if they need to get physical therapy. You're seeing the shift from CMS, mm -hmm. right, to actually reimburse for technology. Because they know if they don't evolve, they'll dissolve. Um, does anybody want to take a guess? Um, what is the current CMS healthcare spending per year? Wow, I, I don't think I would know that. $766 million. About five, ten years ago, it was 200, sorry, billion dollars. About um, five to ten years ago was two hundred billion dollars. What do you think the projection is for the next ten years for spending from Medicare? Almost double. You are a hundred percent correct. One point six trillion. I feel like the lotto guy. One point six trillion dollars. <laughs> but it's not sustainable, and so technology will be the answer, and innovation will too. Part of the answer. That, that's, that's good to know. That's good to know. And um, it does tell us something about the future of medicine, especially for our older adults. Yes. So shifting gears to the term value-based care, and, you know, we have heard the term many times. In fact, we work on the age-friendly health care model, and we also try to evaluate the MIPS measures, which mm -hmm. is part of the value-based yep. care model. Can you further expand on what this actually means to the geriatric population? Yeah, it's a very good question about the fee-for-service versus the value-based world, 
right? Right. And I'll tell you why I'm asking this question, because we are mandated by our federal organizations to, you know, collect these measures, to mm-hmm. basically see what the outcomes are, measuring whether we, whatever we are doing is actually leading to the right outcomes or not. So what's your take on that? Well, I think everything comes down to incentives. Incentives are drivers of human behavior. Ever since we were little kids, if you did your homework, you got to watch a little more TV. You got a little candy, right? Mm -hmm. If you didn't, you went to your room. Same thing here. The incentive for -for fee-for-service means every time I see Sveta's grandmother, every time I see her, I get reimbursed. Now, I'm incentivized to see her more often, and I really don't have an incentive... In reality, as a doctor, I should, but in reality, financially speaking, whether she is healthy or not, whether she goes to the hospital or not, the incentive is fee-for-service per visit. Value-based medicine shifts that incentive. It tells the doctors, look, and the providers, look, we're going to give you 100 patients. For each patient, the cost of care based on all these risk factors and diagnoses is, say, $20,000 a year. Okay. Now, if you're able to save $10,000 by not ordering unnecessary MRIs, by not sending a patient to the hospital unnecessarily, Mm -hmm. that $10,000 that you save us will give you $5,000 from it. But if you go over the $20,000, you're on the hook with us for the cost and the risk as well. So now now the physician is thinking, well, you know what, no, 9 o'clock, you have burning when you urinate, I'm not going to send you to the hospital. Why? I can just easily prescribe an antibiotics to Walgreens, have you go pick it up, and you don't need to go to an ER. But what do you think lies a problem there in that, or could be a problem? What do you think? If I'm as a physician, I'm incentivized to save Mm -hmm. on testing, on expenses for your grandmother, where did my incentive just go now? I don't think I would know that. I do know that you would not be building incentives for sending my grandmother to the hospital. Right. Because you probably will be making more money over there. But in terms of giving an antibiotic... So let's, let's, a, let's reword the question. What if I okay. were to tell you now, Grandma needed an MRI? Okay. Maybe, maybe, I thought ah. she, maybe, maybe I thought she needed an MRI. Okay. But now I know the MRI costs $1,000. Right. Could there be any bad apples that would be like, oh, you sweat this grandmother? Amazing. You don't need an MRI. Everything's okay. Just go walk it. We'll do some physical therapy. Do some stretching up and down. Because what could I be really thinking? That MRI is taking away from me. So we have to be very careful with incentives. How we incentivize. Yeah, now I get it. You're losing that money. You're losing. So we have to be very careful that the quality of care never dips with a value-based model. Because at the end of the day, the patients are first, above money, above everything. It's the human being, it's the patient. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. So moving on to our next question. We know that the care continuum includes going from chronic care to hospice care. What are your thoughts on the current landscape in hospital care? Yeah, hospital care and hospice care and chronic, that's a great question, that It really is. And again, it comes, it comes back from my experience as a resident. I remember a story where I'm a resident in the ICU, and there is a gentleman who is in the ICU, and he has something called anasarca, which is his whole body is swollen. And it's swollen because he's been laying there for some time. And I see the, mo- the wife and the daughter there. And as a, as a, as a resident physician, I'm sitting there, and, and I overhear, and, and, and the daughter says to the mom, Mom, is this what dad would have wanted? He's in the ICU. He's intubated. He's got mm. wires all over. He's got tubes all over. Did you ever have a goals of care discussion with him? And mom says, you know, we, we really never had that discussion. And so what ended up happening was the mom said, well, actually, he told me that his sister was in a hospital, was intubated, and he would never want to be like that. But that discussion was never had between him and his primary care physician. And so he ended up being intubated in the ICU. So the first thing starts with having the goals of care conversations with our geriatric population. So every patient that I would see, I would always say, Mrs. Smith, because remember, if I come to your grandma, Sveta, and I start the goals of care conversation, 
she's going to be thinking, uh-oh, this doctor saw something in my labs, and he's probably thinking I'm not going to last too long, so I'm going to have her nervous the whole night. But if I say, Sveta's grandmother, Medicare asks me to ask these questions as a physician. And so it's, you're okay, everything, but at the end, like, if something happens, do you want to be intubated? Do you want to be resuscitated? And have that conversation. That's one thing. Number two is, as physicians, identifying where in the care continuum our patients are. And Dr. Pandia is great at that. I know. She I is, know. honestly, yeah. I, I, I always say, we stand on the shoulders of rock stars, and Dr. Pandia is someone who I look up to as a role model. She's an academic, she's a true clinician, she's a leader mm -hmm. who I believe is leaving a legacy here at NSU with the work that she's doing. And again, I don't want to go off topic, but because of my respect for her, I, I, I sit there in her office uh, once and you know, the level of humbleness that she has is to aspire. There are people who do 5% of what she's accomplished and walk like they've conquered the world, but I yet she agree, is, yes. but she's, you know, and so I'm, I, I, I know that Dr. Pandia shares in this where that conversation of where a patient is in the care continuum, is it in the chronic care world? Or is it, in the, or is it more comfort care world? Mm -hmm. Or is it the hospice palliative world? That is an important conversation to have, not only for cost savings, but for the quality of life and the dignity of our, of our grandmas and grandpas. I think you're right here, and we have heard and discussed this a lot. In fact, this is one of our main goal of the grant also, to have a discussion and documentation of the goals of care. But at the same time, I do also think that we are in Florida right now, mm -hmm. you know, and we have different population. We have culture issues. We have different ethnicities. We have immigrant population. We have people with no insurance. And, and we have older adults who are in those communities. How do you think that this whole discussion of goals is going to work with that generation? Where well, language is also a barrier, and you as a physician, I know you're doing the right thing, but now you have a challenge in terms of how to communicate to this group. I mean, I don't think that my grandmother or even my dad would be ready to listen to this conversation altogether, just because right. of the, you know, no one wants so, to listen no. that they want to die, you know? Right. It's not easy. So what is your take on that? It's a great question again. You have some really good questions today. It's a very good question. Thank I'll you. tell you, it comes down to really education at the university and at the medical school level and being inclusive with the diversity of the training. So, for example, the approach to end-of-life care or goals of care conversation in a Bukharian community mm -hmm. may be very different than in, a, in an American family, may be very different than in a, a Chinese family or a family from India. Very, because culturally it is different. We have different values. Mm -hmm. It's not wrong or right. It's just different. And therefore, how do you approach that conversation? That needs to be part of that training. The tone you use, the way you signal in that conversation is important. And not just to be very cold. And, and you have to adjust to the culture. Understand its values, its backgrounds, its traditions. You know, like I said... If I come to your, your grandmother, I'm, I'm more than sure, and I, mm -hmm. have, I begin to have that conversation as a doctor with her, and I have her labs, she's going to think that I saw something. And she's going to go to sleep and not sleep the whole night and call you and say, you know, the doctor came and he said, I'm going to die. And I agree with that. You know, because my yeah. grandma's the same. We come very from similar backgrounds. Right, right. Where another person would be like, oh, we just had a goals of care conversation. It was standard. You know, so yes. that is important. And I do believe that some of this education has to start early on in the med school itself, not waiting until the student graduates or is in practice or is seeing a patient right there in the community because I think that it's, it's important that, you know, students go through this or process this while they're studying, while they're working with different population and can learn during that time rather than making mistakes when they're actually practicing. A hundred percent on point. There's a lot that goes into that conversation. A lot of our medical professionals have not been sp trained on public speaking. Mm -hmm. Public speaking is important. You know, how you deliver the message, the cues that you use, how slow you talk, how fast you talk. Uh, whether I'm like talking like this, I'm putting my hands on the table and I'm about to leave and I'm showing you I'm not, I'm not very interested in having this conversation, like uh, I'm in a rush. Or do I say, Sveta, let's sit down for a sec. I just want to talk about that training is just as, as important as histology, as biology, as cosine and sine. You know, ask me about how many ATPs are in a Krebs cycle today. I have no clue. If I could have spent that time being trained on how to speak 
how to deliver good or bad news. I think it would have been... Again, I'm, I know I'm in university, so I'm, I'm no, ruffling no, some feathers. No, I know. I'm laughing here because, you know, if we go and deliver this message back to our clinicians, uh -oh. they'll say, oh, my God, another list on our <laughs> plate. I mean, as if we don't have enough. But you're right. I think communication is something key, especially when it comes to a physician, because you're not only treating the patient. Right. You're also connecting with the patient. And when you're connecting with the patient, you know, you need to kind of understand, you know, how to communicate. So I do hear you. And I agree with you. I just don't know how well that would be received. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you for your response on that. Where do you see healthcare moving in the next 30 years? Well, we talked a lot about moving to the home, but I, I'm going to tell you I'm a big fan of Star Trek, big fan mm -hmm. of Star Trek. And I'll tell you that I believe in the next 30 years there will be a fusion of man and machine. Right? Man and machine. We're already seeing it with Neuralink, with Elon Musk. Think about it this way, right? How did you consume entertainment 20 years ago, Sveta? Where did you, what did you watch? TV. A TV? Yeah, yeah, TV most of the time. How do you consume more of your information now? Cell phone, tablets. Where is it moving towards next? The wearables, right? right the actual, right. the goggles, the AR, the VR, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's, mm -hmm. So look where it's moving. It's moving from the TV mm -hmm. to your hand up close into your face, mm -hmm. and then eventually where is it going to move to? Inside your body. Right. You're going right. to have pills that you're taking that are sensors that I know whether you took your pill or not because it has a sensor that sends out a signal. Right? You're going to have internal sensors to test for your blood pressure, your blood, your hemoglobin, all of that. The fusion of man and machine. It's kind of scary to be honest, because it's I kind know, of like an I know, evolution. I know, yeah. But as you said, we need to evolve, otherwise <laughs> we'll dissolve. dissolve. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay, so let's move to our next question. And this is more about smart homes, which you already spoke about. So nearly 75% of adults ages 50 and older, they want to remain in their homes and for as long as possible as they age. And this I'm observing now is across cultures. It's not only in the American culture. Like, you know, as we are getting old, I'm seeing that this is changing. How do you think that smart home devices, appliances, and technologies can help older adults with chronic conditions accomplish this and preventing nursing home admissions or hospitalizations? That's a great question. I think I'm a big believer in technology, a big believer. But having said that, it's very important that the technology is developed not in a silo of people in Silicon Valley or just tech engineers, mm -hmm. but actually involve the medical students, involve the physicians, the nurses, the academics. Have an interdisciplinary team when you're developing it and also involve the actual stakeholders, the patients, the caretakers. And so that's where I've seen a challenge. I'll give you an example. Babylon Health, mm -hmm. a company that three years ago raised Five, a tech company, a healthcare tech, five hundred and fifty million dollars. That's a lot of money. Three years forward, right now, Babylon Health just declared bankruptcy. Wow! How do you go from five hundred and fifty million dollars to declaring bankruptcy? And I'm not judging. I'm sure it was difficult. They had some bright minds there. I know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this is just to show you how even though we're big proponents of technology, all the money you throw in it, it really has to be done. It's a very tough nut to crack, and it's going to take a lot, but this will be the future. And have you ever used Waze? Yeah, at like the, the navigation system, yeah. right? Yeah. So Uri Levine, who is the founder and he sold Waze to Google mm -hmm. for like a billion plus dollars or something like that, he wrote a book, and it's very nice. It says, focus on the problem not on the solution. Don't get excited about the solution. Focus on the problem. So as you've mentioned, nearly 75% of adults ages 50 and older want to remain in their homes. Mm -hmm. So where should we, as we're designing these things, who should we be talking to? Should we be just in boardrooms or should we go to their homes and ask them, oh, Mrs. Smith, what would you want? Ms. Sveta's grandmother, well, what do you think is good? And get their input and mm -hmm. then focus on the problem that they're going to be describing and then make a solution from that. Okay, so you're talking more about a team-based collaboration. Very And important. then kind of moving from there. Mm -hmm. But the smart home, if someone has a chronic condition, mm -hmm. how do you think one can manage that from the 
home. From a smart home? From a smart home. V very, very easy. I'll give you a real life example. I just went back to New York to visit my family for Thanksgiving. My grandmother is actually connected to a smart home medical home where we monitor her blood pressure, her pulse ox, her heart rate. All of a sudden, from Florida, I noticed that her pulse ox started to go down, her oxygenation, from 99 to 95, 94. I called my dad before I went to, to New York, said, how's she doing? She's swollen, she has some shortness of breath. I'm like, oh, ding, 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 right? So that smart home triggered that, my asking that question. I ordered the chest x-ray, found she had a lot of fluid in her lungs, increased her diuretics, and she didn't go to the hospital. Now think about if she didn't have that smart home. At a very basic level, just mm -hmm. monitoring her oxygen, basic level, nothing fancy, she would have had gone to the hospital because no one would have known that her oxygen is falling. Yes, yeah, she's swollen, ah, she's maybe old, had a little bit of salt. Uh, we saved her from going to the hospital. Think about a 91-year-old going to the hospital. So you spoke about UTI, and I understand that it is easier for a physician to prescribe an antibiotic if it's a regular UTI at home. In your smart home model, which you just discussed, and if the patient needs intravenous antibiotic, how do you think that is going to work? Do you think hospitalization is still required, or it is still for the sickest of the sickest? IV antibiotics, not the crazy guns, but most that are effective, cost 5 to $10. You put them in a saline bag, you infuse it, you mix it, 5 to $10. But someone has to come to your house to do it. A nurse practitioner or an RN for $75 a day. Five days, seven days will cost me $500. How much will the hospital cost me for five days? Uh -huh. Got it. So all these it. things, and when Medicare woke up to it, they said, hold on, let's shift the incentives, let's move things to the home. And you'll see infusions as they are going now at home, everything minus CAT scan and MRI, will be in your home, everything. But as I spoke to the CEOs of the hospital, still certain acute things, the hospital will be a place for the really sick patients who really need to be there. And that's how it should be. Correct. That's how it should be, yes. Correct. It's like, have you ever heard the story where there's a cliff and there's water going down the cliff and there's some water on the bottom and then there's logs that are being thrown from the top and then people on the bottom are they're taking the logs and they're moving them around, they're moving them back, moving them back, but they never asked the question, where are the logs coming from? We should go there and stop them from falling down. Mm -hmm. And that's where I feel the smart home is, is you're going there before mm -hmm. it gets worse. Just out of curiosity, I know you said that in the next five to ten years you see this coming as a big thing. Yes. Is that realistic? Or? Yes, for sure. So moving on to our last question, but one of the most important question: Where can our listeners find more resources on this topic? Definitely. That's a great question. I would say, one, HIMSS, H-I-M-S-S, is a great organization to follow. It involves a lot in the health informatics and the medical space. There's a good book called Age Tech that talks about technology, a good book called The Fourth Industrial Revolution, which also talks about the different patterns and changes in technology, including healthcare, and really leveraging your university settings. A lot of innovation is happening in university centers. For example, the Allen B. Levan Innovation Center is a lot of healthcare tech companies there and different innovative companies focusing on geriatric care as well being developed within there. Those are some of the really great resources one could turn to. And I think those are all wonderful resources, including the information about you and your YouTube video and the music which you just produced, I think all of them can be strengthen the whole library of information that we can receive. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your expertise with our audience. It's been a pleasure having this discussion with you. Likewise. Thank you so much. Really humbled and honored to be here with you. Thank you, Sveta, for an amazing, amazing podcast. Thank you so much once again. Please stay tuned for upcoming topics from our renowned subject matter experts.